My Side of the Mountain, Disc 2. A Brief Account of What I Did About the First Man Who Was After Me At the edge of the meadow, I sensed all was not well at camp. How I knew there was a human being there wasn't clear to me then. I can only say that after living so long with the birds and animals, the movement of a human is like the difference between the explosion of a cap pistol and a cannon. I wormed toward camp. When I could see the man I felt to be there, I stopped and looked. He was wearing a forester's uniform. Immediately, I thought they had sent someone out to bring me in, and I began to shake. Then I realized I didn't have to go back to meet the man at all. I was perfectly free and capable of settling down anywhere. My tree was just a pleasant habit. I circled the meadow and went over to the gorge. On the way, I checked a trap. It was a deadfall, a figure four under a big rock. The rock was down. The food was rabbit. I picked a comfortable place just below the rim of the gorge where I could pop up every now and then and watch my tree. Here, I dressed down the rabbit and fed frightful some of the more savory bites from a young falcon's point of view, the liver, the heart, the brain. She ate in gulps. As I watched her swallow, I sensed a great pleasure. It's hard to explain my feelings at that moment. It seemed marvelous to see life pump through that strange little body of feathers, wordless noises, milk eyes, much as life pumped through me. The food put the bird to sleep. I watched her eyelids close from the bottom up and her head quiver. The fuzzy body rocked, the tail spread to steady it, and the little duck hawk almost sighed as she sank into the leaves, sleeping. I had lots of time. I was going to wait for the man to leave. So I stared at my bird, the beautiful details of the new feathers, the fern-like lashes along the lids, the saucy bristles at the base of the beak. Pleasant hours passed. Frightful would awaken, I'd feed her, she'd fall back to sleep, and I'd watch the breath rock her body ever so slightly. I was breathing the same way, only not as fast. Her heart beat much faster than mine. She was designed to her bones for a swifter life. It finally occurred to me that I was very hungry. I stood up to see if the man were gone. He was yawning and pacing. The sun was slanting on him now, and I could see him quite well. He was a fire warden. Of course, it hasn't rained, I told myself, for almost three weeks, and the fire planes have been circling the mountains and valleys, patrolling the mountains. Apparently, the smoke from my fire was spotted, and a man was sent to check it. I recalled the bare, trampled ground around the tree, the fireplace of rocks filled with ashes, the wood chips from the making of my bed, and resolved hereafter to keep my yard clean. So I made rabbit soup in a tin can I found at the bottom of the gorge. I seasoned it with wild garlic and jack-in-the-pulpit roots. Jack-in-the-pulpits have three big leaves on a stalk and are easily recognized by the curly striped awning above a stiff, serious preacher named Jack. The jack-in-the-pulpit root, or corm, tastes and looks like potato. It should never be eaten raw. The fire I made was only of the driest wood, and I made it right at the water's edge. I didn't want a smoky fire on this particular evening. After supper, I made a bow bed and stretched out with Frightful beside me. Apparently, the more you stroke and handle a falcon, the easier they are to train. I had all sorts of plans for hoods and jesses, as the straps on a falcon are called, and I soon forgot about the man. Stretched on the bows, I listened to the wood peewees calling their haunting good nights until I fell sound asleep. In which I learned to season my food. The fire warden made a fire sometime in the colder hours of the night. At dawn, he was asleep beside white smoldering ashes. I crawled back to the gorge, fed frightful rabbit bites, and slipped back to the edge of the meadow to check a box trap I had set the day before. I made it by tying small sticks together, like a log cabin. This trap was better than the snares or deadfalls. It had caught numerous rabbits, several squirrels, 
and a groundhog. I saw as I inched toward it that it was closed. The sight of a closed trap excites me to this day. I still can't believe that animals don't understand why delicious food is in such a ridiculous spot. Well, this morning, I pulled the trap deep into the woods to open it. The trapped animal was light. I couldn't guess what it was. It was also active, flipping and darting from one corner to the next. I peeked in to locate it so that I could grab it quickly behind the head without getting bitten. I wasn't always successful at this and had scars to prove it. I put my eye to the crack. A rumpus arose in the darkness. Two bright eyes shone, and out through that hole that was no wider than a string bean came a weasel. He flew right out at me, landed on my shoulder, gave me a lecture that I shall never forget, and vanished under the scant cover of trillium and bloodroot leaves. He popped up about five feet away and stood on his hind feet to lecture me again. I said, Scat! So he darted right to my knee, put his broad furry paws on my pants, and looked me in the face. I shall never forget the fear and wonder that I felt at the bravery of that weasel. He stood his ground and berated me. I could see by the flashing of his eyes and the curl of his lip that he was furious at me for trapping him. He couldn't talk, but I knew what he meant. Wonder filled me as I realized he was absolutely unafraid. No other animal, and I knew quite a few by now, had been so brave in my presence. Screaming, he jumped on me. This surprised and scared me. He leapt from my lap to my head, took a mouthful of hair and wrestled it. My goosebumps rose. I was too frightened to move. A good thing, too, because I guess he figured I wasn't going to fight back, and his scream of anger changed to a purr of peace. Still, I couldn't move. Presently, down he climbed as stately as royalty, and off he marched, never looking back. He sank beneath the leaves like a fish beneath the water. Not a stem rippled to mark his way. And so the Baron and I met for the first time, and it was the beginning of a harassing but wonderful friendship. Frightful had been watching all this, she was tense with fright. Although young and inexperienced, she knew an enemy when she saw one. I picked her up and whispered into her birdie-smelling neck feathers, You wild ones know. Since I couldn't go home, I decided to spend the day in the marsh down the west side of the mountain. There were a lot of cattails and frogs there. Frightful balanced on my fist as we walked. She had learned that in the short span of one afternoon and a night, She's a very bright bird. On our way, we scared up a deer. It was a doe. I watched her dart gracefully away and said to Frightful, That's what I want. I need a door for my house, tethers for you, and a blanket for me. How am I going to get a deer? This wasn't the first time I'd said this. The forest was full of deer, and I had already drawn plans on a piece of birch bark for deadfalls, pit traps, and snares. None seemed workable. The day passed. In the early evening, we stole home, tree by tree, to find that the warden had gone. I cleaned up my front yard, scattered needles over the bare spots, and started a small fire with very dry wood that wouldn't smoke much. No more wardens for me. I liked my tree, and although I could live somewhere else, I certainly didn't want to. Once home, I immediately started to work again. I had a device I wanted to try, and put some hickory sticks in a tin can and set it to boiling while I fixed dinner. Before going to bed, I noted this on a piece of birch bark. This night I'm making salt. I know that people in the early days got along without it, but I think some of these wild foods would taste better with some flavoring. I understand that hickory sticks, boiled dry, leave a salty residue. I'm trying it. In the morning, I added, It's quite true. The can is dry and thick with a black substance. It is very salty, and I tried it on frog's legs for breakfast. 
It's just what I've needed. And so I went into salt production for several days and chipped out a niche inside the tree in which to store it. June 19. I finished my bed today. The ash slats work very well and are quite springy and comfortable. The bed just fits in the right-hand side of the tree. I have hemlock boughs on it now, but hope to have deer hide soon. I'm making a figure four trap as tall as me, with a log on it that I can barely lift. It doesn't look workable. I wish there was another way of getting a deer. June 20. I decided today to dig a pit to trap a deer, so I'm whittling a shovel out of a board I found in the stream this morning. That stream is very useful. It's given me tin cans for pots and now an oaken board for a shovel. Frightful will hop from the stump to my fist. She still can't fly. Her wing feathers are only about an inch long. I think she likes me. How a door came to me. One morning, before the wood peewees were up, I was smoking a mess of fish I had caught in the stream. When I caught more than I could eat, I'd bone them, put them on a rack of sticks, and slowly smoke them until they dried out. This is the best way to preserve extra food. However, if you try it, remember to use a hard wood. Hickory is the best. I tried pine on the first batch and ruined them with black, tarry smoke. Well, it was very silent. Then came a scream. I jumped into my tree. Presently, I had enough nerve to look out. Baron Weasel, I said in astonishment. I was sure it was the same weasel I had met in the trap. He was on the boulder in front of the hemlock, batting the ferns with his front feet and rearing and staring at me. Now you stay right there, I said. Of course he flipped and came off the rock like a jet stream. He was at the door before I could stop him and loping around my feet like a bouncing ball. You look glad all over, Baron. I hope all this frisking means joy, I said. He took my pants leg in his teeth, tugged it, and then rippled softly back to the boulder. He went down a small hole. He popped up again, bit a fern nearby, and ran around the boulder. I crept out to look for him. No weasel. I poked a stick in the hole at the base of the rock, trying to provoke him. I felt a little jumpy, so that when a shot rang out through the woods, I leapt a foot in the air and dove into my hole. A cricket chirped. A catbird scratched the leaves. I waited. One enormous minute later, a dark form ran onto the meadow. It stumbled and fell. I had the impression that it was a deer. Without waiting to consider what I might be running toward, I burst to the edge of the meadow. No one was in sight. I ran into the grass. There lay a dead deer. With all my strength, I dragged the heavy animal into the woods. I then hurried to my tree, gathered up the hemlock boughs on my bed, rushed back, and threw them over the carcass. I stuck a few ferns in them so they'd look as if they were growing there, and ran back to camp, breathless. Hurriedly, I put out the fire, covered it with dirt, hid my smoking rack in the spring, grabbed Frightful, and got in my tree. Someone was poaching, and he might be along in a minute to collect his prize. The shot had come from the side of the mountain, and I figured I had about four minutes to clean up before the poacher arrived. Then, when I was hidden and ready, Frightful started her cry of hunger. I hadn't fed her yet that morning. Oh, how was I going to explain to her the awful need to be quiet? How did a mother falcon warn her young of danger? I took her in my hands and stroked her stomach. She fought me, and then she lay still in my hand, her feet up, her eyes bright. She stiffened and drooped. I kept on stroking her. She was hypnotized. I'd stop for a few minutes. She'd lie still, then pop to her feet. I was sure this wasn't what her mother did to keep her quiet, but it worked. Bushes cracked. 
leaves scuttled, and a man with a rifle came into the meadow. I could just see his head and shoulders. He looked around and banged toward the hemlock forest. I crawled up on my bed and stroked the hungry frightful. I couldn't see the man from my bed, but I could hear him. I heard him come to the tree. I could see his boots. He stopped by the ashes of the fire and then went on. I could see my heart lift my sweater. I was terrified. I stayed on the bed all morning, telling the fierce little bundle of feathers in my hand that there was deer meat in store for her if she would just wait with me. Way down the other side of the mountain, I heard another shot. I sure hoped that deer dropped on the poacher's toes and that he would now go home. At noon, I went to my prize. Frightful sat beside me as I skinned and quartered it. She ate deer until she was misshapen. I didn't make any notes as to how long it took me to do all the work that was required to get the deer ready for smoking and the hide scraped and ready for tanning, but it was many, many days. However, when I sat down to a venison steak, that was a meal. All it was was venison. I wrote this on a piece of birch bark. I think I grew an inch on venison. Frightful and I went to the meadow when the meal was done, and I flopped in the grass. The stars came up, the ground smelled sweet, and I closed my eyes. I heard, pip, pop, pop, pop. Who's making that noise? I said sleepily to Frightful. She ruffled her feathers. I listened. Pop, pip. I rolled over and stuck my face in the grass. Something gleamed beneath me, and in the fading light, I could see an earthworm coming out of its hole. Nearby, another one arose, and there was a pop. Little bubbles of air snapped as these voiceless animals of the earth came to the surface. That got me to smiling. I was glad to know this about earthworms. I don't know why, but this seemed like one of the nicest things I had learned in the woods. That earthworms, lowly, confined to the darkness of the earth, could make just a little stir in the world. In Which Frightful Learns Her ABCs Free time was spent scraping the fur off the deer hide to get it ready for tanning. This much I knew. In order to tan hide, it has to be steeped in tannic acid. There's tannic acid in the woods in oak trees, but it took me several weeks to figure out how to get it. You need a lot of oak chips in water. Water and oak give off tannic acid. My problem was not oak or water, but getting a vessel big enough to put the deer hide in. Coming home from the stream one night, I had an inspiration. It had showered the day before, and as Frightful and I passed an old stump, I noticed that it had collected the rain. A stump, an oak stump would be perfect, I said right out loud to that pretty bird. So I felled an oak over by the gorge, burned a hole in it, carried water to it, and put my deerskin in it. I let it steep, oh, maybe five days before I took it out and dried it. It dried stiff as a board, and I had to chew, rub, jump on it, and twist it to get it soft. When this was done, however, I had my door. I hung it on pegs inside my entrance, and because it was bigger than it had to be, I would cut off pieces now and then when I needed them. I cut off two thin strips to make jesses or leg straps for Frightful. All good falcons wear jesses and leashes so they can be tethered for their training. I smoked the meat I couldn't eat and stored it. I used everything I could on that animal. I even used one of its bones for a spearhead. I was tired of catching frogs by the jump-and-miss system. I made two sharp points and strapped them to the end of a long stick, one on each side, to make a kind of fork. It worked beautifully. Frogs were one of my favorite meals, and I found I could fix them many ways. However, 
I got to like frog soup fixed in this way. Clean, skin, and boil until tender. Add wild onions, also water lily buds, and wild carrots. Thicken with acorn flour. Serve in turtle shell. By now, my two pairs of pants were threadbare, and my three sweaters were frayed. I dreamed of a deerskin suit and watched my herd with clothes in mind. The deer from my suit didn't come easily. I rigged up a figure four trap under the log and baited it with elderberries rolled into a ball. That just mushed up didn't work. Then I remembered that deer likes salt. I made a ball of hickory salt with turtle fat to hold it together. Every evening, Frightful and I, sometimes accompanied by the barren weasel, would go to the edge of the meadow and look toward the aspen grove to see if the great log had fallen. One night, we saw three deer standing around it quietly, reaching toward the smell of salt. At that moment, the baron jumped at my pants leg, but got my ankle with an awful nip. I guess I had grown some. My pants and socks didn't meet anymore. I screamed, and the deer fled. I chased the baron home. I had the uneasy feeling that he was laughing as he darted, flipped, buckled, and disappeared. The baron was hard to understand. What did he want from me? Occasionally, I left him bites of turtle or venison, and although he smelled the offerings, he never ate them. The catbird would get them. Most animals stick around if you feed them, but the baron didn't eat anything. Yet he seemed to like me. Gradually, it occurred to me that he didn't have a mate or a family. Could he be a lonely bachelor, taking up with odd company for lack of an ordinary life? Well, whatever. The baron liked me for what I was, and I appreciated that. He was a personable little fellow. Every day I worked to train Frightful. It was a long process. I would put her on her stump with a long leash and step back a few feet with some meat in my hand. Then I'd whistle. The whistle was supposed eventually to mean food to her. So I'd whistle, show her the meat, and after many false flaps she would finally fly to my hand. I would pet her and feed her. She could fly fairly well, so now I made sure that she never ate unless she flew to my fist. One day at breakfast, I whistled for Frightful. I had no food. She wasn't even hungry, but she came to me anyway. I was thrilled. She had learned a whistle meant come. I looked into her steely eyes that morning and thought I saw a gentle recognition. She puffed up her feathers as she sat on my hand. I call this a feather word. It means she's content. Now each day, I stepped farther and farther away from Frightful to make her fly greater and greater distances. One day she flew a good fifty feet, and we packed up and went gathering seeds, bark, and tubers to celebrate. I used my oldest sweater for gathering things. It wasn't very convenient, and each time I filled it, I mentally designed bigger and better pockets on my deer hide suit to be. The summer was wonderful. There was food in abundance, and I gathered it most of the morning and stored it away in the afternoon. I could see now that my niches weren't going to be big enough for the amount of food I'd need for the winter, so I began burning out another tree. When the hickory nuts, walnuts, and acorns appeared, I was going to need a bin. You'd be surprised what a pile of nuts it takes to make one turtle shell full of nut meats. And not a snapping turtle shell either, just a box turtle shell. With the easy living of the summer also came a threat. Hikers and vacationers were in the woods, and more than once I pulled inside my tree, closed my deer flap door, and hid while bouncing, noisy people crossed the meadow on their way to the gorge. Apparently the gorge was a sight for those who wanted a four-mile hike up the mountain. One morning I heard a group arriving. I whistled for Frightful. She came promptly. We dove into the tree. It was dark inside the tree with the flap closed, and I realized that I needed a candle. I planned a lamp of a turtle shell with a deer hide wick, and as I was cutting off a piece of hide, I heard a shrill scream. 
The voices of the hikers became louder. I wondered if one of them had fallen into the gorge. Then I said to Frightful, That was no cry of a human, pretty bird. I'll bet you a rabbit for dinner that our deer trap worked. And here we are, stored in a tree like a nut and unable to claim our prize. I waited and waited until I couldn't be patient anymore, and I was about to put my head out of the tree when a man's voice spoke. Look at these trees. A woman spoke. Harold, they're huge. How old do you think they are? Three hundred years old, maybe four hundred, said Harold. They tramped around, actually sat on the baron's boulder, and were apparently going to have lunch when things began to happen out there, and I almost gave myself away with hysterics. Harold, what's the matter with that weasel? It's running all over this rock. A scream, a scuttering and scraping of boots on the rocks. He's mad, that was the woman. Watch it, Grace, he's coming at your feet. They ran. By this time, I had my hand over my mouth to keep back the laughter. I snorted and choked, but they never heard me. They were in the meadow, run right out of the forest by that fiery, barren weasel. I still laugh when I think of it. It wasn't until dark that Frightful and I got to the deer, and a beauty it was. The rest of June was spent smoking it, tanning it, and finally starting on my deerskin suit. I made a bone needle, cut out the pants by ripping up one pair of old city pants for a pattern. I saved my city pants and burned them bit by bit to make charred cloth for the flint and steel. Frightful, I said while sewing one afternoon. She was preening her now silver-gray, black and white feathers. There's no end to this. We need another deer. I can't make a blouse. We didn't get another deer until fall, so with the scraps, I made big square pockets for food gathering. One hung in front of me and the other down my back. They were joined by straps. This device worked beautifully. Sometime in July, I finished my pants. They fit well and were the best-looking pants I had ever seen. I was terribly proud of them. With pockets and good tough pants, I was willing to pack home many more new foods to try. Daisies, the bark of a poplar tree that I saw a squirrel eating, and puffballs. They're mushrooms, the only ones I felt were safe to eat, and even at that, I kept waiting to die the first night I ate them. I didn't, so I enjoyed them from that night on. They're wonderful. Mushrooms are dangerous, and I wouldn't suggest that one eat them from the forest. The mushroom expert at the botanical gardens told me that. He said even he didn't eat wild ones. The inner bark of the poplar tree tasted like wheat kernels, and so I dried as much as I could and powdered it into flour. It was tedious work, and in August, when the acorns were ready, I found that they made better flour and were much easier to handle. I'd bake the acorns in the fire and grind them between stones. This was tedious work, too, but now that I had a home and smoked venison and didn't have to hunt food every minute, I could do things like make flour. I'd simply add spring water to the flour and bake this on a piece of tin. When done, I had the best pancakes ever. They were flat and hard, like I imagined Indian bread to be. I liked them and would carry the leftovers in my pockets for lunch. One fine August day I took Frightful to the meadow, I'd been training her to the lure. That is, I now tied her meat on a piece of wood covered with hide and feathers. I'd throw it in the air, and she'd swoop out of the sky and catch it. She was absolutely free during these maneuvers, and would fly high into the air and hover over me like a leaf. I made sure she was very hungry before I turned her loose. I wanted her back. After a few tries, she never missed the lure. Such marksmanship thrilled me. Bird and lure would drop to the earth, I'd run over, grab her jesses, and we'd sit on the big boulder in the meadow while she ate. Those were nice evenings. The finest was the night I wrote this. Frightful caught her first prey. 
She's now a trained falcon. It was only a sparrow, but we're on our way. It happened unexpectedly. Frightful was climbing into the sky, circling and waiting for the lure, when I stepped forward and scared a sparrow. The sparrow flew across the meadow. Out of the sky came a black streak. I've never seen anything drop so fast. With a great backwatering of wings, Frightful broke her fall and at the same time seized the sparrow. I took it away from her and gave her the lure. That sounds mean, but if she gets in the habit of eating what she catches, she'll go wild. In which I find a real live man. One of the gasping joys of summer was my daily bath in the spring. It was cold water. I never stayed in long, but it woke me up and started me into the day with a vengeance. I would tether frightful to a hemlock bough above me and splash her from time to time. She'd suck in her chest, look startled, and then shake. While I bathed and washed, she preened. Huddled down in the water between the ferns and moss, I scrubbed myself with the bark of the slippery elm. It gets soapy when you rub it. The frogs would hop out and let me in, and the wood thrush would come to the edge of the pool to see what was happening. We were a gay gathering, me shouting, frightful preening, the wood thrush cocking its pretty head. Occasionally the barren weasel would pop up and glance furtively at us. He didn't care for water. How he stayed glossy and clean was a mystery to me, until he came to the boulder beside our bath pool one day, wet with the dew from the ferns. He licked himself until he was polished. One morning, there was a rustle in the leaves above. Instantly, Frightful had it located. I had learned to look where Frightful looked when there were disturbances in the forest. She always saw life before I could focus my eyes. She was peering into the hemlock above us. Finally, I saw it too. A young raccoon. It was chittering, and now that all eyes were upon it, began coming down the tree. And so Frightful and I met Jesse Coon James, the bandit of the Gribbly farm. He came head first down to our private bath, a scrabbly, skinny young raccoon. He must have been from a late litter, for he wasn't very big and certainly not well fed. Whatever had been Jesse C. James's past, it was awful. Perhaps he was an orphan, Perhaps he'd been thrown out of his home by his mother, as his eyes were somewhat crossed and looked a little peculiar. In any event, he'd come to us for help, I thought, and so Frightful and I led him home and fed him. In about a week he fattened up. His crumply hair smoothed out, and with a little ear scratching and back rubbing, Jesse C. James became a devoted friend. He also became useful. He slept somewhere in the dark tops of the hemlocks all day long, unless he saw us start for the stream. Then, tree by tree, limb by limb, Jesse followed us. At the stream, he was the most useful mussel digger that any boy could have. Jesse could find mussels where three men couldn't. He'd start to eat them, and if he ate them, he got full and wouldn't dig anymore. So I took them away from him until he found me all I wanted. Then I let him have some. Mussels are good. Here are a few notes on how to fix them. Scrub mussels in spring water. Dump them into boiling water with salt. Boil five minutes. Remove and cool in the juice. Take out meat. Eat by dipping in acorn paste flavored with a smudge of garlic and green apples. Frightful took care of the small game supply, and now that she was an expert hunter, we had rabbit stew, pheasant pot pie, and an occasional sparrow, which I generously gave to Frightful. As fast as we removed the rabbits and pheasants, new ones replaced them. Beverages during the hot summer became my chore, largely because no one else wanted them. I found some sassafras trees at the edge of the road one day, dug up a good supply of roots, peeled, and dried them. Sassafras tea is about as good as anything you want to drink. Pennyroyal makes another good drink. I dried great bunches of this and hung them from the roof of the tree room together with the leaves of the winterberry. 
All these fragrant plants I also used in cooking to give a new taste to some not-so-good foods. The room in the tree smelled of smoke and mint. It was the best-smelling tree in the Catskill Mountains. Life was leisurely. I was warm, well-fed. One day, while I was down the mountain, I returned home by way of the old farmhouse site to check the apple crop. They were summer apples and were about ready to be picked. I'd gathered a pouchful and had sat down under the tree to eat a few and think about how I'd dry them for use in the winter when Frightful dug her talons into my shoulder so hard I winced. Be gentle, bird, I said to her. I got her talons out and put her on a log where I watched her with some alarm. She was as alert as a high-tension wire, her head cocked so that her ears, just membranes under her feathers, were pointed east. She evidently heard a sound that pained her. She opened her beak. Whatever it was, I could hear nothing, though I strained my ears, cupped them, and wished she would speak. Frightful was my ears as well as my eyes. She could hear things long before I. When she grew tense, I listened or looked. She was scared this time. She turned round and round on the log, looked up in the tree for a perch, lifted her wings to fly, and then stood still and listened. Then I heard it. A police siren sounded far down the road. The sound grew louder and louder, and I grew afraid. Then I said, No, frightful. If they're after me, there won't be a siren. They'll just slip up on me quietly. No sooner had I said this than the siren wound down and apparently stopped on the road at the foot of the mountain. I got up to run to my tree, but hadn't gotten past the walnut before the patrol car started up and screamed away. We started home, although it wasn't late in the afternoon. However, it was hot and thunderheads were building up. I decided to take a swim in the spring and work on the moccasins I had cut out several days ago. With the squad car still on my mind, we slipped quietly into the hemlock forest. Once again, Frightful almost sent me through the crown of the forest by digging her talons into my shoulder. I looked at her. She was staring at our home. I looked, too. Then I stopped for I could make out the form of a man stretched between the sleeping house and the store tree. Softly, tree by tree, Frightful and I approached him. The man was asleep. I could have left and camped in the gorge again, but my enormous desire to see another human being overcame my fear of being discovered. We stood above the man. He didn't move, so Frightful lost interest in my fellow being. She tried to hop to her stump and preen. I grabbed her leash, however, as I wanted to think before awakening him. Frightful flapped. I held her wings to her body as her flapping was noisy to me. Apparently not so to the man. The man didn't stir. It's hard to realize that the rustle of a falcon's wings is not much of a noise to a man from the city, because by now, one beat of her wings, and I'd awaken from a sound sleep as if a shot had gone off. The stranger slept on. I realized how long I'd been in the mountains. Right at that moment, as I looked at his unshaven face, his close-cropped hair, and his torn clothes, I thought of the police siren and put two and two together. An outlaw, I said to myself. Wow. I had to think what to do with an outlaw before I awoke him. Would he be troublesome? Would he be mean? Should I go live in the gorge until he moved on? How I wanted to hear his voice, to tell him about the Baron and Jesse C. James, to say words out loud. I really didn't want to hide from him. Besides, he might be hungry, I thought. Finally, I spoke. Hi, I said. I was delighted to see him roll over, open his eyes, and look up. He seemed startled, so I reassured him. It's all right, they've gone. If you don't tell on me, I won't tell on you. When he heard this, he sat up and seemed to relax. Oh, 
he said. Then he leaned against the tree and added, Thanks. He evidently was thinking this over, for he propped his head on his elbow and studied me closely. You're a sight for sore eyes, he said, and smiled. He had a nice smile. In fact, he looked nice, and not like an outlaw at all. His eyes were very blue, and although tired, they didn't look scared or hunted. However, I talked quickly before he could get up and run away. I don't know anything about you, and I don't want to. You don't know anything about me and don't want to, but you may stay here if you like. No one's going to find you here. Would you like some supper? It was still early, but he looked hungry. Do you have some? Yes. Venison or rabbit? Well, venison. His eyebrows puckered in question marks. I went to work. He arose, turned around and around and looked at his surroundings. He whistled softly when I kindled a spark with the flint and steel. I was now quite quick at this and had a tidy fire blazing in a very few minutes. I was so used to myself doing this that it hadn't occurred to me that it would be interesting to a stranger. Desdemondia, he said. I judged this to be some underworld phrase. At this moment, Frightful, who had been sitting quietly on her stump, began to preen. The outlaw jumped back, then saw she was tied and said, And who is this ferocious-looking character? That's Frightful. Don't be afraid. She's quite wonderful and gentle. She'd be glad to catch you a rabbit for supper if you'd prefer that to venison. Am I dreaming? said the man. I go to sleep by a campfire that looked like it was built by a boy scout, and I awaken in the middle of the 18th century. I crawled into the store tree to get the smoked venison and some cattail tubers. When I came out again, he was speechless. My storehouse, I explained. I see, he answered. From that moment on, he didn't talk much. He just watched me. I was so busy cooking the best meal that I could possibly get together that I didn't say much either. Later, I wrote down the menu, as it was excellent. Brown puffballs in deer fat with a little wild garlic. Fill pot with water, put venison in, boil. Wrap tubers in leaves and stick in coals. Cut up apples and boil in can with dog-tooth violet bulbs. Raspberries to finish meal. When the meal was ready, I served it to the man in my nicest turtle shell. I had to whittle him a fork out of the crotch of a twig as Jesse Coon James had gone off with the others. He ate and ate and ate, and when he was done, he said, May I call you Thoreau? That'll do nicely, I said. Then I paused, just to let him know that I knew a little bit about him, too. I smiled and said, I'll call you Bando. His eyebrows went up. He cocked his head, shrugged his shoulders, and answered, That's close enough. With this he sat and thought. I felt I'd offended him, so I spoke. I'll be glad to help. I'll teach you how to live off the land. It's very easy. No one need find you. His eyebrows gathered together again. This was characteristic of Bando when he was concerned, and so I was sorry I had mentioned his past. After all, outlaw or no outlaw, he was an adult, and I still felt unsure of myself around adults. I changed the subject. Let's get some sleep, I said. Where do you sleep? he asked. All this time sitting and talking with me, and he hadn't seen the entrance to my tree. I was pleased. Then I beckoned, walked a few feet to the left, pushed back the deer hide door, and showed Bando my secret. Thoreau, he said, you are quite wonderful. He went in. I lit the turtle candle for him. He explored, tried the bed came out and shook his head until I thought it would roll off. We didn't say much more that night. I let him sleep on my bed. His feet hung off, but he was comfortable, he said. 
I stretched out by the fire. The ground was dry, the night warm, and I could sleep on anything now. I got up early and had breakfast ready when Bando came stumbling out of the tree. We ate crayfish, and he really honestly seemed to like them. It takes a little time to acquire a taste for wild foods, so Bando surprised me the way he liked the menu. Of course, he was hungry, and that helped. That day we didn't talk much, just went over the mountain collecting foods. I wanted to dig up the tubers of the Solomon seal from a big garden of them on the other side of the gorge. We fished, we swam a little, and I told him I hoped to make a raft pretty soon so I could float into deeper water and perhaps catch bigger fish. When Bando heard this, he took my axe and immediately began to cut young trees for this purpose. I watched him and said, you must have lived on a farm or something. At that moment, a bird sang. The wood peewee, said Bando, stopping his work. He stepped into the woods, seeking it. Now I was astonished. How would you know about a wood peewee in your business? I grew bold enough to ask. And just what do you think my business is? He said as I followed him. Well, you're not a minister. Right. And you're not a doctor or a lawyer. Correct. You're not a businessman or a sailor. No, I'm not nor do you dig ditches. I do not. Well, guess. Suddenly, I wanted to know for sure, so I said it. You're a murderer or a thief or a racketeer, and you're hiding out. Bando stopped looking for the peewee. He turned and stared at me. At first I was frightened. A bandit might do anything but he wasn't mad. He was laughing. He had a good deep laugh and it kept coming out of him. I smiled, then grinned and laughed with him. What's funny, Bando? I asked. I like that, he finally said. I like that a lot. The tickle deep inside him kept him chuckling. I had no more to say, so I ground my heel in the dirt while I waited for him to get over the fun and explain it all to me. Thoreau, my friend, I am just a college English teacher lost in the Catskills. I came out to hike around the woods, got completely lost yesterday, found your fire and fell asleep beside it. I was hoping the scoutmaster and his troop would be back for supper and help me home. Oh, no, my comment. Then I laughed. You see, Bando, before I found you, I heard squad cars screaming up the road. Occasionally... You read about bandits that hide out in the forest, and I was just so sure that you were someone they were looking for. We gave up the peewee and went back to the raft making, talking very fast now and laughing a lot. He was fun. Then something sad occurred to me. Well, if you're not a bandit, you'll have to go home very soon, and there's no point in teaching you how to live on fish and bark and plants. I can stay a little while, he said. This is summer vacation. I must admit I hadn't planned to eat crayfish on my vacation, but I am rather getting to like it. Maybe I can stay until your school opens, he went on. That's after Labor Day, isn't it? I was very still, thinking how to answer that. Bando sensed this. Then he turned to me with a big grin. You really mean you're going to try to winter it out here? I think I can. Well. He sat down, rubbed his forehead with his hands, and looked at me. Thoreau, I've led a varied life. Dishwasher, sax player, teacher. To me, it's been an interesting life. Just now, it seems very dull. He sat a while with his head down then looked up at the mountains and the rocks and trees. I heard him sigh. Let's go fish. We can finish this another day. That's how I came to know Bando. We became very good friends in the week or ten days that he stayed with me, and he helped me a lot. We spent several days gathering white oak acorns and groundnuts, harvesting the blueberry crop 
and smoking fish. We flew frightful every day just for the pleasure of lying on our backs in the meadow and watching her mastery of the sky. I had lots of meat, so what she caught those days was all hers. It was a pleasant time, warm with occasional thunder showers, some of which we stayed out in. We talked about books. He did know a lot of books and could quote exciting things from them. One day, Bando went to town and came back with five pounds of sugar. I want to make blueberry jam, he announced. All those excellent berries and no jam. He worked two days at this. He knew how to make jam. He'd watched his pa make it in Mississippi, but we got stuck on what to put it in. I wrote this one night. August 29. The raft is almost done. Bando has promised to stay until we can sail out into the deep fishing holes. Bando and I found some clay along the stream bank. It was as slick as ice. Bando thought it'd make good pottery. He shaped some jars and lids. They look good, not wedgewood, he said, but containers. We dried them on the rock in the meadow, and later Bando made a clay oven and baked them in it. He thinks they might hold the blueberry jam he's been making. Bando got the fire hot by blowing on it with some homemade bellows that he fashioned from one of my skins that he tied together like a balloon. A reed is the nozzle. August 30. It was a terribly hot day for Bando to be firing clay jars, but he stuck with it. They look jam-worthy, as he says, and he filled three of them tonight. The jam is good. The pots remind me of crude flower pots without the hole in the bottom. Some of the lids don't fit. Bando says he'll go home and read more about pottery making so that he can do a better job next time. We like the jam. We eat it on hard acorn pancakes. Later. Bando met the Baron Weasel today for the first time. I don't know where the Baron Weasel has been this past week, but suddenly he appeared on the rock and nearly jumped down Bando's shirt collar. Bando said he liked the Baron best when he was in his hole. September 3. Bando taught me how to make willow whistles today. He and I went to the stream and cut two fat twigs about eight inches long. He slipped the bark on them. That means he pulled the wood out of the bark, leaving a tube. He made a mouthpiece at one end, cut a hole beneath it, and used the wood to slide up and down like a trombone. We played music until the moon came up. Bando could even play jazz on the willow whistles. They're wonderful instruments, sounding much like the wind in the top of the hemlocks. Sad tunes are best suited to the willow whistles. When we played The Young Voyager, tears came to our eyes. It was so sad. There were no more notes for many days. Bando had left me saying, Goodbye, I'll see you at Christmas. I was so lonely that I kept sewing on my moccasins to keep myself busy. I sewed every free minute for four days, and when they were finished, I began a glove to protect my hand from frightful sharp talons. One day, when I was thinking very hard about being alone, frightful gave her gentle call of love and contentment. I looked up. Bird, I said, I had almost forgotten how we used to talk. She made tiny movements with her beak and fluffed her feathers. This was a language I had forgotten since Bando came. It meant she was glad to see me and hear me, that she was well-fed and content. I picked her up and squeaked into her neck feathers. She moved her beak, turned her bright head, and bit my nose very gently. Jesse Coon James came down from the trees for the first time in ten days. He finished my fish dinner. Then, just before dusk, the baron came up on his boulder and scratched and cleaned and played with a fern leaf. I had the feeling we were all back together again. In which autumn provides food and loneliness. 
September blazed a trail into the mountains. First, she burned the grasses. The grasses seeded and were harvested by the mice and the winds. Then she sent the squirrels and chipmunks running boldly through the forest, collecting and hiding nuts. Then she frosted the aspen leaves and left them sunshine yellow. Then she gathered the birds together in flocks, and the mountaintop was full of songs and twitterings and flashing wings. The birds were ready to move to the south. And I, Sam Gribbley, felt just wonderful. Just wonderful. I pushed the raft down the stream and gathered arrow leaf bulbs, cattail tubers, bulrush roots, and the nut-like tubers of the sedges. And then the crop of crickets appeared, and Frightful hopped all over the meadow, snagging them in her great talons and eating them. I tried them, because I'd heard they're good. I think it was another species of cricket that was meant. I think the field cricket would taste excellent if you were starving. I wasn't starving, so I preferred to listen to them. I abandoned the crickets and went back to the goodness of the earth. I smoked fish and rabbit, dug wild onions by the pouchful, and raced September for her crop. October 15. Today, the barren weasel looked moldy. I couldn't get near enough to see what was the matter with him, but it occurs to me that he might be changing his summer fur for his white winter mantle. If he is, it's an itchy process. He scratches a lot. Seeing the baron changing his mantle for winter awoke the first fears in me. I wrote that note on a little birch bark, curled up on my bed, and shivered. The snow and the cold and the long, lifeless months are ahead, I thought. The wind was blowing hard and cool across the mountain. I lit my candle, took out the rabbit and squirrel hides I'd been saving, and began rubbing and kneading them to softness. The baron was getting a new suit for winter. I must have one, too. Some fur underwear, some mittens, fur-lined socks. Frightful, who was sitting on the footpost of the bed, yawned, fluffed, and thrust her head into the slate-gray feathers of her back. She slept. I worked for several hours. I must say here that I was beginning to wonder if I shouldn't go home for the winter and come back again in the spring. Everything in the forest was getting prepared for the harsh months. Jesse Coon James was as fat as a barrel. He came down the tree slowly, his fat falling in a roll over his shoulders. The squirrels were working and storing food. They were building leaf nests. The skunks had burrows and plugged themselves in at dawn with bunches of leaves. No drafts could reach them. As I thought of the skunks and all the animals preparing themselves against the winter, I realized suddenly that my tree would be as cold as the air if I didn't somehow find a way to heat it. Notes Today I rafted out into the deep pools of the creek to fish. It was a lazy sort of autumn day, the sky clear, the leaves beginning to brighten, the air warm. I stretched out on my back because the fish weren't biting, and hummed. My line jerked, and I sat up to pull, but was too late. However, I wasn't too late to notice that I had drifted into the bank, the very bank where Bando had dug the clay for the jam pots. At that moment, I knew what I was going to do. I was going to build a fireplace of clay, even fashion a little chimney of clay. It'd be small, but enough to warm the tree during the long winter. Next day. I dragged the clay up the mountain to my tree in my second-best pair of city pants. I tied the bottoms of the legs, stuffed them full, and as I looked down on my strange cargo, I thought of scarecrows and Halloween. I thought of the gang dumping ash cans on Third Avenue and soaping up the windows. Suddenly, I was terribly lonely. The air smelled of leaves and the cool wind from the stream hugged me. The warblers in the trees above me seemed gay, 
and glad about their trip south. I stopped halfway up the mountain and dropped my head. I was lonely and on the verge of tears. Suddenly, there was a flash, a pricking sensation on my leg, and I looked down in time to see the baron leap from my pants to the cover of fern. He scared the loneliness right out of me. I ran after him and chased him up the mountain, losing him from time to time in the ferns and crow feet. We stormed into camp an awful sight, the baron bouncing and screaming ahead of me and me dragging that half-scarecrow of clay. Frightful took one look and flew to the end of her leash. She doesn't like the baron and watches him, well, like a hawk. I don't like to leave her alone. End notes. Must make fireplace. It took three days to get the fireplace worked out so that it didn't smoke me out of the tree like a bee. It was an enormous problem. In the first place, the chimney sagged because the clay was too heavy to hold itself up, so I had to get some dry grasses to work into it so it could hold its own weight. I whittled out one of the old knot holes to let the smoke out and built the chimney down from this. Of course, when the clay dried, it pulled away from the tree, and all the smoke poured back in on me. So I tried sealing the leak with pine pitch, and that worked all right, but then the funnel over the fire bed cracked, and I had to put wooden props under that. The wooden props burned, and I could see that this wasn't going to work either, so I went down the mountain to the site of the old Gribbly farmhouse and looked around for some iron spikes or some sort of metal. I took the wooden shovel that I had carved from the board and dug around what I thought must have been the back door or possibly the wood house. I found a hinge, old handmade nails that would come in handy, and finally, treasure of treasures, the axle of an old wagon. It was much too big. I had no hacksaw to cut it into smaller pieces, and I wasn't strong enough to heat it and hammer it apart. Besides, I didn't have anything but a small wooden mallet I had made. I carried my trophies home and sat down before my tree to fix dinner and feed Frightful. The evening was cooling down for a frost. I looked at Frightful's warm feathers. I didn't even have a deer hide for a blanket. I had used the two I had for a door and a pair of pants. I wished that I might grow feathers. I tossed Frightful off my fist and she flashed through the trees and out over the meadow. She went with a determination strange to her. She's going to leave, I cried. I've never seen her fly so wildly. I pushed the smoked fish aside and ran to the meadow. I whistled and whistled and whistled until my mouth was dry and no more whistle came. I ran onto the big boulder. I couldn't see her. Wildly, I waved the lure. I licked my lips and whistled again. The sun was a cold, steely color as it dipped below the mountain. The air was now brisk, and Frightful was gone. I was sure that she had suddenly taken off on the migration. My heart was sore and pounding. I had enough food, I was sure. Frightful wasn't absolutely necessary for my survival, but I was now so fond of her. She was more than a bird. I knew I must have her back to talk to and play with if I was going to make it through the winter. I whistled. Then I heard a cry in the grasses up near the white birches. In the gathering darkness I saw movement. I think I flew to the spot. And there she was. She had caught herself a bird. I rolled into the grass beside her and clutched her jesses. She didn't intend to leave, but I was going to make sure that she didn't. I grabbed so swiftly that my hand hit a rock and I bruised my knuckles. The rock was flat and narrow and long. It was the answer to my fireplace. I picked up Frightful in one hand and the stone in the other, and I laughed at the cold, steely sun as it slipped out of sight because I knew I was going to be warm. This flat stone was what I needed to hold up the funnel and finish my fireplace. And that's what I did with it. I broke it into two pieces, set one on each side under the funnel, lit the fire, closed the flap of the door, and listened to the wind bring the first frost to the mountain. I was warm. Then 
I noticed something dreadful. Frightful was sitting on the bedpost, her head under her wings. She was toppling. She jerked her head out of her feathers. Her eyes looked glassy. She's sick, I said. I picked her up and stroked her, and we both might have died there if I hadn't opened the tent flap to get her some water. The cold night air revived her. Air, I said. The fireplace used up all the oxygen. I've got to ventilate this place. We sat out in the cold for a long time because I was more than a little afraid of what our end might have been. I put out the fire, took the door down, and wrapped up in it. Frightful and I slept with the good frost nipping our faces. Notes. I cut out several more knot holes to let air in and out of the tree room. I tried it today. I have Frightful on my fist watching her. It's been about two hours and she hasn't fainted and I haven't gone numb. I can still write and see clearly. Test. Frightful's healthy face. This ends disc two.